Desire of Ages, Chapter 27 Thou Canst Make Me Clean Of all diseases known in the East, the leprosy was most dreaded. Its incurable and contagious character and its horrible effects upon its victims filled the bravest with fear. Among the Jews it was regarded as a judgment on account of sin, and hence was called the stroke, the finger of God. Deep-rooted, ineradicable, deadly, it was looked upon as a symbol of sin. By the ritual law the leper was pronounced unclean. Like one already dead, he was shut out from the habitations of men. Whatever he touched was unclean. The air was polluted by his breath. One who was suspected of having the disease must present himself to the priests who were to examine and decide his case. If pronounced a leper, he was isolated from his family, cut off from the congregation of Israel, and was doomed to associate with those only who were similarly afflicted. The law was inflexible in its requirement. Even kings and rulers were not exempt. A monarch who was attacked by this terrible disease must yield up the scepter and flee from society. Away from his friends and his kindred, the leper must bear the curse of his malady. He was obliged to publish his own calamity, to rend his garments and sound the alarm, warning all to flee from his contaminating presence. The cry, unclean, unclean, coming in mournful tones from the lonely exile, was a signal heard with fear and abhorrence. In the region of Christ's ministry, there were many of these sufferers, and the news of his work reached them, kindling a gleam of hope. But since the days of Elisha the prophet, such a thing had never been known as the cleansing of one upon whom the disease had fastened. They dared not expect Jesus to do for them what he had never done for any man. There was one, however, in whose heart faith began to spring up. Yet the man knew not how to reach Jesus. Debarred as he was from contact with his fellow men, how could he present himself to the healer? And he questioned if Christ would heal him. Would he stoop to notice one believed to be suffering under the judgment of God? Would he not, like the Pharisees and even the physicians, pronounce a curse upon him and warn him to flee from the haunts of men? He thought of all that had been told him of Jesus. Not one who had sought his help had been turned away. The wretched man determined to find the Savior. Though shut out from the cities, it might be that he could cross his path in some byway along the mountain roads, or find him as he was teaching outside the towns. The difficulties were great, but this was his only hope. The leper is guided to the Saviour. Jesus is teaching beside the lake and the people are gathered about him. Standing afar off, the leper catches a few words from the Saviour's lips. He sees him laying his hands upon the sick. He sees the lame, the blind, the paralytic, and those dying of various maladies rise up in health, praising God for their deliverance. Faith strengthens in his heart. He draws nearer and yet nearer to the gathered throng. The restrictions laid upon him, the safety of the people, and the fear with which all men regard him are forgotten. He thinks only of the blessed hope of healing. He is a loathsome spectacle. The disease has made frightful inroads and his decaying body is horrible to look upon. At sight of him, the people fall back in terror. They crowd upon one another in their eagerness to escape from contact with him. Some try to prevent him from approaching Jesus, but in vain. He neither sees nor hears them. Their expressions of loathing are lost upon him. He sees only the Son of God. He hears only the voice that speaks life to the dying. Pressing to Jesus, he casts himself at his feet with the cry, Lord, if thou wilt, 
Thou canst make me clean. Jesus replied, I will be thou made clean, and laid his hand upon him. Immediately a change passed over the leper. His flesh became healthy, the nerves sensitive, the muscles firm, the rough scaly surface peculiar to leprosy disappeared, and a soft glow like that upon the skin of a healthy child took its place. Jesus charged the man not to make known the work that had been wrought, but straightway to present himself with an offering at the temple. Such an offering could not be accepted until the priests had made examination and pronounced the man wholly free from the disease. However unwilling they might be to perform this service, they could not evade an examination and decision of the case. The words of Scripture show with what urgency Christ enjoined upon the man the necessity of silence and prompt action. He straightly charged him, and forthwith sent him away, and saith unto him, See thou say nothing to any man, but go thy way, show thyself to the priest, and offer for thy cleansing those things which Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. Had the priests known the facts concerning the healing of the leper, their hatred of Christ might have led them to render a dishonest sentence. Jesus desired the man to present himself at the temple before any rumors concerning the miracle had reached them. Thus an impartial decision could be secured and the restored leper would be permitted to unite once more with his family and friends. There were other objects which Christ had in view in enjoining silence on the man. The Savior knew that his enemies were ever seeking to limit his work and to turn the people from him. He knew that if the healing of the leper were noised abroad, other sufferers from this terrible disease would crowd about him and the cry would be raised that the people would be contaminated by contact with them. Many of the lepers would not so use the gift of health as to make it a blessing to themselves or to others. And by drawing the lepers about him, he would give occasion for the charge that he was breaking down the restrictions of the ritual law. Thus his work in preaching the gospel would be hindered. The event justified Christ's warning. A multitude of people had witnessed the healing of the leper and they were eager to learn of the priest's decision. When the man returned to his friends, there was great excitement. Notwithstanding the caution of Jesus, the man made no further effort to conceal the fact of his cure. It would indeed have been impossible to conceal it, but the leper published the matter abroad. Conceiving that it was only the modesty of Jesus which laid this restriction upon him, he went about proclaiming the power of this great healer. He did not understand that every such manifestation made the priests and elders more determined to destroy Jesus. The restored man felt that the boon of health was very precious. He rejoiced in the vigor of manhood and in his restoration to his family and society, and felt it impossible to refrain from giving glory to the physician who had made him whole. But this act in blazing abroad the matter resulted in hindering the Saviour's work. It caused the people to flock to him in such multitudes that he was forced for a time to cease his labours. Every act of Christ's ministry was far-reaching in its purpose. It comprehended more than appeared in the act itself. So in the case of the leper. While Jesus ministered to all who came under him, he yearned to bless those who came not. While he drew the publicans, the heathen, and the Samaritans, he longed to reach the priests and teachers who were shut in by prejudice and tradition. He left untried no means by which they might be reached. In sending the healed leper to the priests, he gave them a testimony calculated to disarm their prejudices. The Pharisees had asserted that Christ's teaching was opposed to the law which God had given through Moses, but his direction to the cleansed leper to present an offering according to the law disproved this charge. It was sufficient testimony for all who were willing to be convinced. 
the leaders at Jerusalem had sent out spies to find some pretext for putting Christ to death. He responded by giving them an evidence of his love for humanity, his respect for the law, and his power to deliver from sin and death. Thus he bore witness of them, they have rewarded me evil for good and hatred for my love. He who on the mount gave the precept, love your enemies, himself exemplified the principle, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but counterwise blessing. The same priests who condemned the leper to banishment certified his cure. This sentence, publicly pronounced and registered, was a standing testimony for Christ. And as the healed man was reinstated to the congregation of Israel, upon the priest's own assurance that there was not a taint of the disease upon him, he himself was a living witness for his benefactor. Joyfully he presented his offering and magnified the name of Jesus. The priests were convinced of the divine power of the Savior. Opportunity was granted them to know the truth and to be profited by the light. Rejected, it would pass away, never to return. By many, the light was rejected, yet it was not given in vain. Many hearts were moved that for a time made no sign. During the Savior's life, his mission seemed to call forth little response of love from the priests and teachers, but after his ascension, a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. The work of Christ in cleansing the leper from his terrible disease is an illustration of his work in cleansing the soul from sin. The man who came to Jesus was full of leprosy. Its deadly poison permeated his whole body. The disciples sought to prevent their master from touching him, for he who touched a leper became himself unclean. But in laying his hand upon the leper, Jesus received no defilement. His touch imparted life-giving power. The leprosy was cleansed. Thus it is with the leprosy of sin, deep-rooted, deadly, and impossible to be cleansed by human power. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. From the sole of the foot even unto the head, there is no soundness in it but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. But Jesus, coming to dwell in humanity, receives no pollution. His presence has healing virtue for the sinner. Whoever will fall at his feet, saying in faith, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean, shall hear the answer, I will be thou made clean. In some instances of healing, Jesus did not at once grant the blessing sought, but in the case of leprosy, no sooner was the appeal made than it was granted. When we pray for earthly blessings, the answer to our prayer may be delayed, or God may give us something other than what we ask. But not so when we ask for deliverance from sin. It is His will to cleanse us from sin, to make us His children, and to enable us to live a holy life. Christ gave Himself for our sins that He might deliver us from this present evil world, according to the will of God and our Father. And this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He heareth us. And if we know that He hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of Him. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness.